I just also, this is something I sometimes forget. Um, I often forget to push record, which is embarrassing. But I also like to, for us to do a land acknowledgement. So I've been working on this, um, trying to craft something that is meaningful, but here's what I've come up with so far. Um, our Los Angeles Santa Monica Mountains CN CNPS chapter recognizes that we occupy land originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tataviam, Serrano, and Chumash peoples. We honor and pay respect to them, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of California's lands and their native flora. So um, now I'd like to introduce our speakers and they can do their presentation. Uh, this evening, Robert Rock is the Chief Operations Officer of Living Habitats and is the principal designer of the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. Catherine Pacardoni is the nursery manager for the project. And tonight they will outline the history and progress regarding, regarding the wildlife crossing. Um, so Robert, you have the stage, you're gonna share your screen and do your presentation. And then I think Catherine will follow up. Great, thanks Jody. Yeah, I'm gonna, <clears throat> you guys can give me a second here. I'm gonna pull up the, the slides and then I'm gonna turn off my camera for a moment so my bandwidth doesn't suffer and I don't have a, a lag time with the slides. Okay. Um, so, uh, we'll go through that way, give me one second. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> so before I launch into the, the slides, um, I, I'd like to start simply by, by thanking the uh, California Native uh, Plant Society for inviting us uh, to this presentation, for allowing Catherine and I this opportunity. Um, we realize that this project benefits from the passionate support of many people, some of whom you know are here on our, on our Zoom call and listening in today, uh, that have likely contributed in a number of different ways. Um, and it's that support that continues to drive us forward. And I just wanted to make sure that right at the onset, we're expressing our, our heartfelt thanks and gratitude for, for all of you and the, the, the ways in which you contribute. Uh, and also to you, Snowdy, for helping to facilitate this talk and making it happen and keeping us all on point. Um, uh, with that, so I'll, I'll jump into the presentation here. Um, I, the plan here is for me to run through some slides and then hand it over to Catherine and leave plenty of time for, for Q and A. Um, we're clearly here to talk about the, you know, what I like, like to call the unsung heroes of the work that we all do and the stuff that we collectively all geek out about the, uh, the plants. Uh, but in this particular case, the plants are, you know, part of this, you know, subtle, obscure, tiny little project that no one's heard about. Right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm being facetious, of course. Uh, you don't have to be particularly local to have seen the illustratives that our Living Habitats team has created, you know, or to know the plight of P22, or <clears throat> to have been inspired by the, the tenacious perseverance of the woman in this photo, Beth Pratt, who uh, you all know is the public face of the Save Valley Cougars campaign. But it's also important as we're jumping into this to understand the, the nature of the, the five core partners. Um, the five core partners as part of the project uh, are obviously the National Wildlife Federation, uh, but working hand in hand with Caltrans, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and the Mountain Recreation Conservation Authority, uh, the National Park Service, the Santa Monica Mountains, and the local resource conservation district of the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, the reason that, uh, and, and to kind of launch this off, I wanted to start with somewhat of a, an executive summary. This is a little bit of a perforated presentation. We're gonna go through how all of these pieces kind of make their way into the project nursery. Um, and as I go through each of these things, you'll, you'll start to see that the, the important role that the project nursery plays and how Catherine and her colleagues at the SAMO Fund 
uh, are the ones helping to facilitate that and achieve this design vision for the project. Uh, but when we, to start this off, I think it's important to acknowledge also that it really does start with people. Now, I've got an incredible team that I work with at Living Habitats. We're all involved in a multitude of different facets of the project, but at the core of how we work is collaboration. We work with our clients, you know, work with our other experts and innovators, you know, the expanded LH staff and our expanded design team, you know, the various functional units at Caltrans and experts from each of the project partners. You know, this list that I've got up here is kind of an abbreviated list of the talents, expertise, and the skill sets that are part of this team. But at the end of the day, we're being asked or we're being tasked, I should say, with bridging this genetic divide, right? Creating what I like to refer to as this comprehensive ecological stitch, which is the reason that, I, that we've titled the presentation. And to do that, we have to think beyond the structure. You know, this is a series, the, the slide really is documenting a series of design parameters that we developed early on to help us organize and direct the dialogue as we advance the design of the crossing with the, and the construction with, with the, the design team and with Caltrans. But I wanna take one little sidestep back and I apologize, I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but I think it's important that we also talk about the tools that we use in the design process to communicate. You know, is, is something like this all we need? Is this the only toolkit we need? Or, you know, does this meet the goals and the objectives of the project? And I'd argue that communication runs deeper than that. So beyond the ardent supporters and the like-minded colleagues, it's about, for me, and I think for many of the, the core entities as part of the project partnership team, it's also about how we're inspiring and reaching that next generation. So these slides are a couple of things that I pulled from a presentation that I did for the Ladera Stars Academy about two years ago. It's a community just north of the crossing site. And you know I had the luxury of having a child about the same age as those that I was presenting to. So I figure if I can explain the challenge of why we need a wildlife crossing, to an eight-year-old, then the rest of us can probably grasp the importance and the complexity. But moreover, it's an opportunity to translate all this complexity and this importance to this generation that will truly benefit from the work that we're all doing and hopefully pick up that torch and carry it forward. Now, I'm, I suspect that most people on the call here are familiar with the Wallace Sandberg Wildlife Crossing and where it's located. But if not, I wanted to make sure that I pointed out a couple of key things about the project site. It's located obviously along the, the 101 freeway, you know, in this area between the Simi Hills and Santa Monica Mountains. It's the last 1600 feet along the 101 where we have publicly held lands on either side of the freeway. And that's important because to put something like this together and to really create this diverse ecological stitch and make it functional, making sure that we are landing down in this protected space is a key component. Now, <clears throat> as I run through the presentation, you're gonna see me jump back and forth a little bit, zooming in to the micro and then zooming back out to the macro several times, starting here with the history. I do this not just because, you know, it's not just a spastic response to, to how to present, um, but it's because we need to understand how we have to work at both scales. We have to kind of look at the landscape from the elevation that you'd look at if you're flying in a plane and then look all the way down at the cells in a leaf structure on a microscope, you know, and for, you know, for us to be able to do that, you know, we have to understand how we as, as humans have transformed this piece of land that we're working with and at what scales we can enact restoration. You know, so when you look at maps like this and you understand how this space evolved over time, how we've manipulated the land, it starts to give us cues as to how we look for a strategy in restoration. So for the sake of time, I've really omitted a huge chunk of, you know, the, the design slides here, because I don't think that it's, uh, you know, it would take up probably another two hours of the presentation to go through design interventions on the structure and, and things like that. But I thought it would be good to point out a couple things. You know, looking at a, a plan like this, I think, you know, as we talk about this, we're focusing on the stage one area. There are two stages of this project. There's the piece that everyone has seen in construction right now, the superstructure over the freeway, over the 101. That's the stage one piece. It's in construction right now, continuing forward. And then the other area that's outlined here in the kind of light red or orange outline 
is the contiguous footprint for what we've referred to as stage two. In total, it's about 13 acres worth of space, about one acre of space over the freeway, adjoining 12 acres of space uh, split between the two sides of the road. And we're obviously you know, connecting across not only the 101 freeway, but we're covering over former Vendel. There's a utility structure that sits below, and there's another structure that will cross Agora Road here to the south. And then when I talk about this ecological stitch, what I'm talking about is the infusion of this ecological approach into the design process. That means that we're taking the biotic and the abiotic elements that drive this design and we're or that, that are part of this design, and we're using them to drive those decisions. How, how is the landscape and the way that it functions going to serve the, the needs and the goals of the project? And how does that relate to all the rest of the facets, the structure of the different components that go into it all the way through? But ultimately, we've got a really interesting, you know, a re really interesting challenge here in the fact that our real clients, our stakeholders of the wildlife we're designing for, and, you know, and it's it's very well known that the project is built upon decades of inspired commitment from Seth Riley and Jeff Sickage, you know, and their their urge to study the plight of the California mountain lions and the Santa Monica's. And that's complemented by a series of their colleagues and members of our design team that have studied numerous other species that are native to the region. We've got plenty of fun spreadsheets like this, you know, to represent that data. And I know this is a really sexy graphic to look at in the presentation, uh, but I wanted to put it up here as a, a first piece uh, of the equation, because I think it's it's important to show that we've spent the time going through and culled through this information, but then we've also found ways to start to pull that out, make that more accessible, talk about a sample population within the Santa Monica's, you know, how they're moving through, what are their home ranges like, how does how do those overlap, how do those occupy a space that we're designing, what time of day and what kind of movement is happening? You know, are we working with exclusively diurnal or nocturnal or crepuscular? Species, you know, are we understanding how they're mating, they're nesting, their habit, uh, what their habitat is like? You know, understanding how the animals' characteristics relate to the landscape and the plant community that we're superimposing on this new construction site. Not just the plant communities and the relationship between them. You know, these very specific communities like the chaparral or the coastal sage scrub, uh, the oak woodlands that are very much a part of the Santa Monica Mountains, but also how do those plant communities relate to the microhabitat? that these species need and want, you know, what's their diet, what eats them, you know, what are they looking for for shelter and understanding this balance between open and closed habitat, edged habitat, and really how do we take these types of things and translate these cues into the design of the project? So again, I'm gonna step step back to another component here. So when we look at things from this 30,000 foot level, we have to understand what are the components that are gonna influence the plant community? You know, one of those things is obviously where water is coming from, right? So we're, we study the hydrology, you know, and in doing this, you know, we go through these types of mapping exercises where, you know, looking at a, a plot like this from, you know, from the 1900 survey, and then you step to the next, Aerial in the you know 1928, and then you start to look at how that's evolved as we've changed the roadway in 1944, and then when you do that overlay between 1928 and 1944, you start to see how we've fractured this space. Right, we've we've changed how water flows, we've changed you know how it moves through space, but then if you take that and blow that way out, and you zoom all the way out regionally, and you understand that we exist within this larger system. Right. Understanding that as we look to reimagine this connection, how can we begin to reconnect that hydrology in a manner that's complementary and environmentally beneficial? Because the site's only about 13 acres, but it's part of this much larger watershed. And as we zoom out and look at this, you start to see that the mountains and this location, are, it's, it's just as connected to the mountains as it is to the ocean. You know, and so we step in a step looking at Malibu Creek watershed. You look at the sub watersheds that are part of the project site itself. And then we identify hot spots within this where we do need to focus our attention on these areas where we are gonna have an impact to existing creeks, where we don't want to create a deleterious effect on, those water, on the water quality. Uh, but we're also looking at how do we design plant communities that 
are helping us arrest erosion at the same time as we're building biodiversity. And then going a step further, you know, we've, you know, we're creating a giant green roof on steroids. You know, can we harness the water off of the bridge structure itself? And instead of pumping it into a sewer system, can we pull it back into the habitat areas? You know, and, you know, as this graphic is, is you know, extrapolating even further, then stepping into the next chapter of this, like how are we looking at soils? How are soils different on top of a structure like this suspended above the freeway versus areas where we're on grade? And so we step into, you know, the lens of geomorphology, you know, and aside from being a terribly geeky word, why does geomorphology work? Why does it matter, right? It's because, you know, it's how we look at how geology inform the current conditions, you know, looking at stone weathering, you know, and the types of stone around site, the chemical, the physical, physical weathering, and how that makes its way into the soil characteristics that we have as part of the, the project site and things that we need to be able to understand so that as we recreate spaces that we're impacting, that we're designing, that's commensurate with what's there on site. So that jumps directly then into soil health. And we'll expand upon this a little bit more when we get to some of the stuff that's happening in the nursery. But <clears throat> a lot of time and effort has gone into understanding how, you know, in any urban environment. And yes, this is a piece of space along the freeway that isn't, you know, residential or commercial property or terribly impacted by other kind of uh, rudimentary, you know, or, or kind of uh, standard urban envelope elements. But it is, it's, it has been impacted by our human ingenuity and the way we've created our transportation patterns and our transportation networks and utilities and all of those things that go along with it. And we have to look to human ingenuity to restore the, this, this health of the soil to support the final habitat. So as we dive, you know, so we dive into the micro, this is an analysis by the mycologist who's on our team, looking at the existing soils on the site to understand the biological health, to understand the mycorrhizal fungi that are present in the soil sample that we've pulled. And then looking at these other cores that were done on site with our soil scientists to understand what the kind of the, the various horizons are within the soil layers, what's there. You know, it's also very revealing to start to see where the burn scars are at from the Woolsey fire to understand how much of the ecology was baked out of the soil as part of the intensity of that fire making its way through. But <clears throat> it's multiple site, uh, multiple samples from various locations on the site. And it's, important because the vegetation depends on this mutualistic relationship between the fungi and the plant, right? And it, the entire system of how fungal content, bacteria, and microorganisms create a nutrient cycling capacity in the soil is about how plants sustain themselves in these natural environments, not to mention the link between microbial biomass in the soil and carbon sequestration. Um, but I, I could go on about this stuff for hours. And so, like I said before, T Catherine's gonna touch on some of this stuff a little bit later. So I'll simply say that as we endeavored to get the project nursery underway as a part of the project, we began working with the National Park Service and a, an intern that was working with them at the time to start to collect mushrooms. So mushrooms as the fruiting bodies of the mycorrhizal fungi, you know, specifically in ectomycorrhizal association with oaks, um, and use that native soil biology for use in inoculating both the finished habitat areas on the project itself, along with the way that we are actively using that in the project nursery, where we're growing our plants and uh, pairing the plants with the native soil biology so that ultimately we're aiming at supporting a better plant establishment by re reconstructing this full profile, you know, from the microscopic organism uh, all the way through to the individual plant communities. So getting to the fun stuff now. So as we look at, at vegetation, you know, so how about the vegetation, right? Um, one of the questions I get a lot is how are we as Chicagoans, you know, my practice is, uh, is, is headquartered in Chicago. How are we going to pick plants for Southern California, right? It's a fair question, but it's not an insurmountable one. This, this graphic that I pulled here, again, I said I've got plenty of sexy spreadsheets. You know, this is an even more comprehensive one. This is a snippet of this much more nuanced planting schedule that we've crafted with input from 
individuals at MRCA, uh, people you know from the biology uh, functional unit at Caltrans, the vast knowledge of native vegetation from the National Park Service, all of whom have worked on restor restoration projects across this area and are you know, are, are the experts that are living and breathing this every day. And it really is truly that collaboration, that dialogue with them that allows us to come into this conversation and, and create a, a strategy and an approach that really does, you know, resonate and respond to the location. You know, so we, we take all of that content and then we begin to distill this down, analyzing the specific conditions that we either, either are inheriting on the site or we're creating through our work and through the design process. And how do all these species respond to everything from slope aspect to the soil electrical connectivity, right? And then pairing that with what community they're a part of and how it relates to habitat, whether it's for beneficial insects and pollinators, or it relates to cover for that open and closed habitat we need for some of the species. But then, there's this other interesting piece of complexity in that we have to look to fold things into Caltrans standards, right? We are working hand in hand with Caltrans to do the documentation and oversee the construction. So how can we begin to evolve the language around how we show landscape in that Caltrans standard world and define things like open and closed habitat, you know, terms that are not necessarily a part of the lexicon of all things in the Caltrans standards. Uh, and make that a part of how we are evolving a strategy, right? How do we take what we might typically do, you know, if we're working on a conventional design project or a careful restoration project elsewhere, we might elect to show a planting plan in a different manner. But what we've done as a way of working through this process and having that truly collaborative exchange with the folks at Caltrans to make sure that this is legible and, and, and works within their system, is that we've transformed the way that we look at these planting areas into a series of modules and planting zones and fit them into the stationing that we've got on the structural drawings so that there's a way to translate this through and create that reciprocity in the dialogue between how we're loading dead load and plants and soil and drainage and all of these things on top of the structure and how that relates to how the structure needs to perform, right? But in addition to that, you know, We've got this incredibly specific plant list with these lofty goals, you know, not just for how it ties to project performance, but we're working in one of 36 biodiversity hotspots worldwide. That's incredible. You know, how can we, how can we reinforce support and invest in the efforts to support this biodiversity as we aim to recover from the Woolsey fire? Well, you know, it's, it's easy. We'll just, you know, we'll create our own project nursery, right? <laughs> <clears throat> excuse my cough. I'm laughing at myself because I can't hear if anybody else is laughing on the, uh, on the call. I think it's funny. Um, in, in hindsight, it seems, it seems easy to say that we realized early on that the nursery is a critical element to supporting this project, you know, both from the, the sheer mechanics of growing a plant to size for installation, but it's also a reflection of the commitment to preserving these hyperlocal genetics and bolstering this site that sits within this cri critical biodiversity hotspot. And we need to get this up and going now, right? You know, in the context of when this was happening, this is before construction had begun. This is while we were still finishing up the design documents uh, and getting ready to put this out on the street to bid. So that we need to have this nursery up and going to really achieve this goal. So the nursery concept really quickly evolved into a reality through this incredible collaboration between the National Wildlife Federation, MRCA, and NPS and the SAMO Fund, you know, and so we, you know, and this is a, this is a photo that's a little bit further along in the process of, of the nursery, but along, along with that, right, we're, we're creating this nursery, uh, we've got this thing, you know, kind of wheels in motion, but now we need a project nursery manager, right, one that's clearly able to handle dust control efforts here, um, so we worked with, with NPS and the SAMO Fund to seek out the correct type of talent, and I'm fortunate enough to say that we found not only the talents needed in this position, but we also found someone who can deal with the demands of this important project. And perhaps less importantly to some, but 
for me, maybe more importantly, is she can deal with my particular flavor of sarcasm and spirit. Uh, and I'm really hoping that uh, that Catherine is giggling at this photo on the other side here uh, while she's muted, uh, because it's really awkward making jokes and having no one respond to the jokes while uh, while I'm making them. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to, to Catherine. Uh, Catherine's an employee of the SAMA Fund. Uh, she's the nursery manager for the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing Native Plant Nursery. Everyone was laughing, Rock. Fantastic. I was laughing. They were laughing. They just <laughs> shy. Um, right, hello, well, let everybody. Let me let me know when you let me know when you want me to advance slides. All right. Okay, I will. Um, Hello, everybody. I'm Catherine Pacquardini. I'm the nursery manager for the Project Nursery. Um, and the image you saw of me um, shooting water out, seemingly wasting water, was not me wasting water. Um, that was our very first access to water at the project site. So it was kind of a monumental moment. Um, and the, the water, believe it or not, is all recycled water for the entire nursery. So that's something that was uh, pretty special. Um, next slide. Um, one thing before we dive into the process of having developed the nursery, one of the very important things with this project uh, was to get the respectful blessing um, of the Tataviam and in particular our uh, the tribal consultant for this project, Alan Salazar. So he did a uh, site blessing prior to us beginning any work, doing any trenching, um, bringing the water to the site or, or anything like that. And so wanted to um, acknowledge that the site itself is on the ancestral lands of the Tataviam. And um, it was a real honor to have him come with also National Park Service um, officials and uh, kind of bless, bless the beginning of this very cool project. And this was um, early in 2022. Next slide. So as you can see, the, the project location itself, the nursery location is not on flat ground. It is not in an already developed area. Um, and uh, we had to work with um, sloped conditions um, at this particular um, park um, and uh, terrace and start from scratch um, all the all the construction and development. So we had to create um, terraces, put down weed fabric, build everything from scratch, bring in a construction trailer. That's our pretty much only indoor space to do our work. Um, the tables that we built were um, all metal. Uh, took months to to. Uh, assemble and had the wonderful help of friends, um, family in the case of my dad in the top right uh, slide, uh, top right photo over there. Um, we wanted to be as light on the land as possible in addition to having access to that recycled water. The, there was no electricity um, and so we had to uh, think how to bring electricity to the site to be able to operate some of our um, basic tools, our refrigerator, things like that. So um, we do have these solar panels that is providing the bulk of the electrical needs for uh, for the project. Next slide. And we've had the excellent help of uh, the National Park Service, SAMO Fund, um, other groups. We had National Park Service have uh, staff work days where they helped us assemble 50 tables. We had project um, uh, people from SAMO Fund who are partners, um, organizational partners. Um, so we had the Outward Bound Adventures come and help us. So we had um, a lot of wonderful hands contributing towards the building of this nursery. So the building of the nursery started pretty much when I was hired in early 2022. Um, and it went throughout pretty much almost an entire year. Um, next slide. And in the process of the building was also the seed scouting um, and the seed collection in preparation for being able to plant, uh, actually sow seeds and, and produce plants. So the plant production component needed pretty much almost an entire year of prep uh, prep time in the form of building the nursery, constructing it, develop it uh, developing it from scratch, and then also having um, uh, many, many opportunities to go out hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains um, and doing seed scouting, identifying where the species were located that were on, you know, the grow list um, and uh, doing ethical collections, um, an ethical collection being that we don't ever take 
too much off of a single plant. We identify a larger population, take small amounts from more species to capture more of that genetic diversity um, and not, not taking more than anything that we need um, and trying to get from lots of different um, locations if possible. Again, trying to get a nice diverse um, gene pool represented, um, after which we would process the seeds. In this graphic, you're seeing the, the process for acorns in, in specific. Um, and acorns are uh, something that we have collected, we have grown, um, and ties also to our um, some of the work that we're doing with the mycorrhizal fungi. Next slide. So here are some images of some of that seed collection as well as some of the early mushroom collections. So th this again was done prior to the nursery being up and running officially um, in the sense of being able to even propagate plants yet. It was not, you know, we didn't have the table set up necessarily, um, but we have to do all this kind of preparatory work because when it is time, when it is go time to actually grow plants, we need to have the seeds on hand when it's time to um, create our eco pile beds, which I'll talk more about later. Um, we needed to have the mushroom, we needed the spores, we needed the those kinds of um, fungal tissues to work with. So we did a lot of this kind of work um, in that first year. And those seeds in the bottom left corner, you don't have to go back to the slide, but the seeds in the bottom left corner, we actually collected a million seeds in the first year, which was kind of cool. Um, and uh, this is a, an image of Julia. Julia is our assistant nursery manager. And what we're doing here is we're taking a collection of um, California sagebrush, again, to tie back to the, to the ethics of how we collect. One of the other kind of valuable components that I think is a little bit unique about our, um, our project is also in how, how we're trying to reach, um, reach different groups and also incorporate other facets of culture into um, into our work. So for instance, Julia is a member of the Tataviam tribe. And at this particular outing, um, she um, took seeds and left um, a strand of her own hair at each collection site as a way of giving back. So there was this reciprocal nature. It wasn't just about, um, from a scientific point of view, making sure we're taking ethical collections, but also having this kind of a, a spiritual um, uh, component to, to what we were doing. So um, that's something that Julia has kind of brought to this uh, team and to the, the kind of emotions of, of this project that's pretty special. Um, and this is one of the most beautiful um, hillsides. Leading up to work, I was coming to work numerous times and seeing the, the hillsides covered in lupines. And I um, asked the Caltrans biology team if we would be able to um, collect the, the seeds off of this because we would need these seeds to sow uh, for later in the project. And if you see in the next slide, we have all these wonderful seed pods. So if you ever had the the urge to always, you know, pull over on the side of the freeway and go get native plants, like I always do, um, this is one of those projects that I, I had the we had, this whole team had such a great um, privilege to be able to have Caltrans as our partners on the project. So we got to pull over on the side of the freeway, collect local lupine seeds from the side of the freeway. And they were processed um, back at the nursery and they're stored in the refrigerator as we speak. And in addition um, to more of that seed collection, we've also been doing some um, kind of rescues and interventions when there were any kind of native plants that are going to be impacted by the project. So in particular, we did um, some narrow leaf milkweed uh, rescue missions, uh, several where we've collected uh, seeds from numerous narrow leaf milkweed plants that were going to be impacted by construction, also attempted some uh, transplanting of actual plants um, when the seeds were not available. Next slide. And back at the nursery. So we have um, Julia, who you've already met in on the right. And then we have Jose, who's our other nursery tech on the left. Um, he is um, somebody who came from the uh, SAMO Fund and National Park Service site. He'd worked for three, uh, three years at another nursery out in Rancho Sierra Vista and brings a lot of really great technical knowledge and skill to, uh, to the nursery. So we're really fortunate to have the both of them um, helping us. And in this particular slide, 
we are seeing um, our solarization stations. So what we wanted to do is make sure that we designed the nursery in a way that had certain standards for uh, hygiene, cleanliness, nursery best management practices. One of which is all the tables you saw that we set up was 50, you know, 50 or so tables. They're all elevated three feet off the ground, maximizing airflow, maximizing um, the, the reduction of splash. We want to make sure that everything has um, really good um, kind of airflow and access to sunlight and things like that. Um, and then in this case here, what you're seeing is um, a solarization area where in the summertime, we lay down any kind of used materials, used soils or used pots and cover them in plastic and pretty much bake them um, with the intention that we're ne not necessarily, you know, allowing pathogens to make their way back into the nursery. We're always making sure that we're um, starting with either clean materials or if we're using repurposed materials that they've been sanitized. Next slide. And here we have our fun part. So we collected all those seeds. We spent the whole first year collecting seeds and developing the nursery. Now we have tables. We actually have a place to put them. We have soil. Um, and so we're uh, using this potting mix. And in this case, you're seeing uh, little seedlings of Asclepius fasciculares, which is narrow leaf milkweed um, being planted in these, um, in these little plug trays here. Next. And so we do a combination. Usually um, what we started with was using propagation flats um, and just sowing all the seeds in propagation flats. On the right-hand side, you'll see some of our friends at Outward Bound transplanting little seedlings that have been removed from the prop flat. And now they're being planted in each of these little individual plugs so that they can get a little bit bigger. And then from the plugs are planted into a larger size. Um, and on the left-hand side, you're also seeing Julia and Jose um, doing um, direct sowing. So we've also done some where we just direct sow if it's the grass seed or something like that, that we have a really good chance of um, understanding whether the germination is gonna be good. Then we, we just direct sow it into these trays. And the trays, next. <laughs> Yes, there we go. Okay, so the trays themselves um, are, uh, and the, just the pots themselves that we're using, we wanted to make sure to use um, air pruning technology. So I wanted to make sure that the roots of the plants that we start up um, on uh, for this project all have a good head start and have a really um, healthy root system before they end up in their final sizes. And so we have on the left-hand side, the 60 count plug tray. On the right-hand side, you're seeing the root ball of a plant that came out of um, one of our larger celled um, pots. And so the, the technology, if most of you are familiar, if you've ever gone to a nursery and you've ever taken a pot off of a plant, um, the image of a bunch of coiling roots at the bottom of the plant or around the sides of the pot is something that's a familiar site. It's something that I see when, you know, I even grow plants in a regular solid walled plastic pot. Um, but what we're doing here is we're actually growing the plants in a pot where when the roots hit the side walls, they actually contact the air. They don't contact a solid surface. And when they contact the air, the tip of the root desiccates. It just dries up, um, which in essence prunes them. And when you prune anything, if you've ever pruned a branch of a, of a tree or a branch of a shrub, what does that do? It triggers a bunch more growth of other lateral branches. So something similar happens with a root system. Once the tip of the root burns off, um, and then it just sends more roots from inside. And so what you end up as a final product is a plant that has no coiling roots, but a jillion active live roots that all came from the center. Next slide. Super technical term with Jillian there. A Jillian, a Jillian bajillion. <laughs> And so this is one of the plugs on the right hand side, fully rooted. You don't see a single root other than a couple of the root tips. But if I shook all that soil off of that, you would see it was just this mass of roots. And so when um, when you transplant something like that, the the uh, likelihood that it will take faster and start to root faster and get established faster is much higher. And so what we found with this is, you know, we had something started in this. Um, size, put it into a gallon, and like within a month it was fully rooted, which was just amazing. 
Um, and so you can see a lot of the grasses um, are in these plug trays. Um, and in fact, we started everything in these plug trays. So you can see on all these tables, um, they went either from either straight directly sown into these or they were planted in the propagation flats and then transplanted into these. And then they were bumped up to um, a larger size. Next slide. And there they are, there's a close up. This is Epilobium canum, which is the California fuchsia and has been doing very, very well here. Next slide. Now is the fun part. I mean, all of it's fun. I'm not uh, bashing any other part of this presentation, um, but this is one of the most exciting aspects of this. One of the reasons why it's so exciting is because um, when I applied for the job, uh, the job description talked about, you know, needing to have a familiarity with like soil science and things like that. And I knew very little, if anything about that. I knew mycorrhizae was good, for native plants, that was about the extent of it. But this um, uh, position has really allowed me to work with experts who know so much about this and to apply some of this um, new understanding to the, the way that we're operating into the nursery. And so what we are introducing to you is this concept of the eco pile. And so eco piles um, have um, a, um, a function whereby we are creating a, uh, I've I referenced it as like a sourdough starter of sorts that contains within it um, like a bunch of um, native mycorrhizal fungi or fungal spores um, that we can then extract the spores or the, the fungus in, in a liquid and then apply it to our plants. And so, in the, this case, we have two different distinct types of ecopiles. One focuses on ectomycorrhizal fungi and one that focuses on endomycorrhizae. And so ectomycorrhizae is specific to our oak trees and some other oak species. They produce fruiting bodies in the form of mushrooms, um, which release spores, which is like the seed of the fungus. Um, and endomycorrhizae produce spores, but they do it underground. So they don't produce um, a fungus, a, a mushroom. And so what we have are two different uh, strategies that we have to kind of reproduce and in essence almost farm and um, be able to extract the fungus or the and the spores from these beds and then be able to apply them either to the project site or to the plants here. So the three beds that you see in the foreground are for the endomycorrhizae um, species, and the three beds in the background are for the ectomycorrhizae. The ecto are full of three different species of oak trees, oak saplings planted like a foot apart from each other, which seems absurd. And some people are wondering, well, why on earth are you doing this? Um, but it's basically because as my, for those of you who don't know, mycorrhizae is mutualistic fungus. It associates with its host plant. It requires its host plant. Its host plant kind of requires it. Um, so when they are together, then the process of col root colonization, the process of um, the colonization of the soil with that fungus um, can take place. If we just have the fungus sp fungal spores in there and they didn't have anything to uh, get activated about and attach to and colonize, um, we likely would see a reduction in, in the spores. So we wanted to make sure that it has a lot of roots in there of their associated host. And in this case, it's the oaks. And in the case of the um, endomycorrhizae or the arbuscular mycorrhizae, they have a much more generalized uh, range of hosts um, from lots of different plant families. So we planted out the bed with a variety of species, including um, you know, grasses and uh, herbaceous perennials and um, many things in the aster family, sages, even a ceanothus. Um, so we have a nice little mix in there. And the idea being that we're, we're developing and understanding and still tweaking methods for how to um, extract that and apply it to the project. And we're doing that in concert with this amazing man who is um, the expert mycologist on the, pro uh, on the project. And so he has led a lot of our mushroom expeditions, uh, mushroom hunting expeditions. And he's been leading a lot of the, the efforts as it relates to um, the testing and the, the progress we're making with this kind of uh, project. Next. 
and voila, here are some mushrooms. And I will say just as a disclaimer, how important it is to be doing this with um, an actual expert. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, could go wrong. <laughs> there are mushrooms that are pathogenic. Um, not every mushroom is beneficial. Not every mushroom is going to help um, the environment. So we're we're doing this always, 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 always with the expert guidance of a mycologist and making sure that anything that we're collecting is um, identified and kind of vouched for. And we have records of every single thing that we've collected. So on the left, you see a live you know mushroom. On the right, you see the dried tissues of um, the spore carrying portions of the of the mushrooms all in this wonderful little bowl. And that's millions, billions, actually, billions of spores in that uh, bowl on okay. the right. Catherine, can I throw one other thing in here before you go to the next slide? Yes. Just to reinforce what Catherine's saying here, I think it's important for everyone to understand this is not, we are not foraging for mushrooms. It's not edible mushrooms. These are mycorrhizal associated fruiting bodies. This is it's simply about the soil ecology. It's not about harvesting them for any form of human consumption. So it's just important that everybody understands that as we're looking at these things. Yes, that and in addition, um, the, you know, we hear about, um, what is the, gosh, I can't think of the name. Oh, our malaria, you know, that that's a fungus that would, <clears throat> uh, mushrooms, which would appear near oak trees. Somebody might think it's uh, mycorrhizal, oh, because it's near oak trees, but it's actually creates horrific, you know, rot diseases in oak trees. And so a little bit of ignorance could cause a lot of harm um, in our ecosystem. So it is just really, really important um, to always be working with an expert. And we're very, very fortunate to have one um, on the project team. Um, so uh, so here is just an example of um, how we um, are tinkering with and, and um, thinking of ways that we can extract um, the, the spores and the fungal uh, material and be able to apply it onto the plants. Um, and um, and also apply it into the eco pile beds. Um, the two strategies for ecto and endo um, are different. Um, the ecto, when we when we do get all that mushroom um, tissue and all those spores, we it's simply making a nice chocolatey looking blend uh, blended smoothie, um, which is what you're looking at there. But it's uh, again well, not edible. Not, not edible. edible. Not <laughs> edible. When I say smoothie and chocolate, <laughs> I mean neither of those things are edible. Um, no, this, this is, is our breakfast. slurry. <laughs> this is our slurry of um, spores and uh, mushroom tissues that we apply into the eco pile beds with the hope that they will colonize the the host plants roots and uh, proliferate and then be able to be uh, used that material will be able to be kind of uh, reduced and then used um, in uh, in the nursery and potentially at the project. Um, so that's that's specific to mycorrhizae. Um, so that's something that we're we're really targeting uh, in a in a really uh, targeted way. Uh, for mycorrhizal fungi. And then we also have the liquid biological amendment component, which is um, focused on all the other bacteria, uh, all the other biology, which includes bacteria, which includes protozoa, which includes um, other kinds of fungus that isn't mycorrhizal necessarily. And so we do have a process too, where we're uh, obtaining certain materials like fish brew and compost and worm castings and producing a liquid kind of extract um, and um, and and able to apply it onto the plants as well to inoculate them with other other life, and so it's about you know not only the conversation about building the soil at the project site, but it's also about um, introducing that and building it here so that when it does go uh, to the project site, it kind of fits more seamlessly and also has with it all of its associated friends. And so we see here some of the microscopy work that we get to do. This is something that. Um, Jose um, on the right um, has really taken to and, and feels really um, you know, fortunate to learn more about. It's something I also feel really fortunate to learn more about. And it's like thrilling to be able to pull something like this up on a, on a slide. And I, I wish I had this in video form because this was just a still taken from a video. And the reason why I wanted it on video is because the whole thing is dancing. The, there's so much life in this one droplet of liquid biological inoculant, um, and it's it's fascinating to see. And so to be able to do that in the nursery, apply it to the plants, knowing you're giving life to the soil, even, even a potting mix um, is pretty, pretty cool. Next slide. 
And so aside from obviously the development of the nursery, aside from the seed collection, um, aside from the the uh, soil uh, the soil and the my, uh, mycological work that we're doing, a big targeted focus too on the nursery is also the messaging and the sharing and the ability to create graphics to talk about what we do and why we do it. Um, and so this is one such graphic that the Living Habitats design team uh, produced in addition to all the other ones that you have been uh, seeing. And it just kind of runs through the, the purpose of what we're doing. Um, and it whether it's by showing a graphic like that or it's um, actually hosting indigenous youth to reconnect with their culture. Here, Julia is teaching indigenous youth how to process acorn flour um, with, a, with a milling stone. That's a traditional milling stone. In the next slide, um, she's teaching Samo youth, which is a um, another youth group that's run through the National Park Service. She's teaching them about milkweed, narrowleaf milkweed, and how to make cordage out of the um, dried stalks of narrowleaf milkweed and is showing them uh, the milkweed at different life stages before they go and actually process it. And so there's the one of the joys of this actual project itself is that ability to um, connect with others and to share and do that kind of an outreach and also to have our own staff, myself, Jose and Julia, be able to learn so much more from the other experts who are part of the team. So without further ado, oh, and part of that um, full circle kind of quality, if you remember the picture of the Caltrans biology team with the narrow leaf milkweed and the seed pod um, of uh, narrow leaf milkweed that we rescued from the site. Um, one of the other components of what we're doing and that what we continue to do is to think of ways how do we um, how do we touch other uh, parts of this project and how do we set it up set up future stages of this project for success. And so those seeds of the narrow leaf milkweed, we already grew them, we already plant uh, we already had them in pots. And then we are just in the process of planting them at the site. And in fact, are going to be landscaping the entire nursery site with plants that we've been growing from these local seeds, from these local um, areas. And we're gonna be planting them out um, as seed banks, as these like seed farms so that we can draw upon the seeds here and be able to apply it back to the project. So the nursery itself um, is going to serve as this kind of ongoing seed farm um, and provide some seed security for the project long term. So um, that's one of the fun things we're embarking on now. And that's us. <laughs> and that's a wrap. And that's a wrap. <laughs> it's 803. So with that, I mean, Snowdy, if you're okay, we'd, uh, we'd obviously like to open it up to any questions that anybody has. I had a couple come in. Um, one just, my chat kind of just disappeared. Uh, but um, the somebody asked was, what was that colorful mushroom? Was it a rainbow mushroom? <laughs> <laughs> um, unless you know off the top of your head, Catherine, I could go back to, to Efren and ask that question. I don't remember if, off the top of my head. If it was the one in the earlier slide, it might have been one of the bolites, but I don't know which one. But I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And then somebody asked about the, the graphics that you mentioned, the, especially towards the end of the program. Um, are those available to the public? Uh, most most of the graphics that we've got are, are things that we're using in tandem as part of the project. If anyone's interested in specific ones, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, a lot of the stuff is uh, there are things that I'll need to loop back to to Beth and to, to her colleagues uh, at NWF about before they're released more publicly. But I wouldn't. Uh, most of the stuff that's here is stuff that we've shared previously, so most of it should be accessible and able to be shared. Uh, another couple of questions have come in. Uh, I think I we know the answer to this. Uh, when the wildlife crossing is completed, it's not open to the public. It's not a public park. 
Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, I think it, that's one of the more interesting facets for me. I, I'm in the in the grand construct of everyone who's worked on the project. You know, dating back, you know, literally three decades. I, I'm fairly new to the team, even though I've been working on it for quite some time. But one of the pieces that's important to understand right from the get-go is that part of that public engagement process that Caltrans has to go through with these sorts of projects, that was a resounding response from the community was this reaction to, should there be trails on the crossing site to connect you know, north and south? And it was the community that came back and responded and said, no, absolutely not. This is for wildlife only. Um, what are the plans, uh, long-term plans for the grow yard? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. And it's one that I am going to avoid as much as possible because I am not entirely sure. And I think there's plenty of discussion that needs to happen with the project partners as to what it evolves into or how it evolves uh, after it is no longer directly serving the, the project needs. How is that for being kind of as political as possible in answering that? <laughs> um, are those plant lists um, um, that you showed, are, are they somewhere on a um, website, a public available website? They are not, but the plant list for stage one is something that is public information. It was released as part of the, the bidding documents for the project. And so that's something that would be more than happy to send you that list, Snowden, and you can share it with others within the, the group here. Okay, we'll see how we could do that. Where exactly is the nursery located? The nursery is located off of Las Virginis, just north and uh, up the slope behind Fire Station 125, north of the freeway. And are you looking for volunteers? Absolutely, right, Catherine? <laughs> I guess then the question would be, how does one volunteer? I'll put Catherine, you, I'll, I'll uh, put my email in the chat. Yeah. And anyone can uh, email my work email and uh, we'll add you to the um volunteer database and anytime we have a volunteer event we just send a blast to everybody and if you can make it that's great um let me find a way to get to everybody and then somebody's asking a question do you know if this project is helping single family neighbors uh reconsider their plant material hmm that's an interesting question. Um, whoever put that up, could you elaborate a little bit more on what that uh, on that question? That's Isabel Duvivier. Isabel, yeah, do you I just I just wondered if all the press about the project and all the excitement about the project might be getting some of those adjacent single family communities that probably have a lot of lawn and swimming pools that they may be rethinking the way they landscape since they're going to be adjacent to a corridor where they might see more activity, animal activity? Sure, sure. I know. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I'm sure that there are plenty of, plenty of questions that, that, uh, and, and dialogue around that as part of the work that, you know, Kelsey, who I believe is on here does as part of Cougar Conservancy and being mindful of the, you know, the, that uh, relationship between natural environments and, and spaces that we inhabit. Um, but I think the other piece of this too is that the it, as part of this partnership, we're working hand in hand with the city of Agora Hills, and I know that they've had a, a real emphasis on uh, wanting to help reinforce the messaging behind this. Uh, but in terms of a, a targeted campaign, um, I mean, if you have other ideas about whom else out to reach out to, I'd be more than happy to to do that and, and engage in in dialogue. Is there a metric for success uh, of the wildlife crossing by animals, by the fauna? Does How is anybody going to know in the future that this has been worth the effort? So I, I have to be careful about what I, what I'm, what I, what I, the way that I answer this, because um, there's some work that we are currently doing uh, in collaboration with the wildlife biology team uh, around monitoring and evaluation that relates to efficacy of the project on a whole multitude of different facets. Um, it's not really ready for public consumption, but it is something that we are building 
what that is, uh, so that we we do have a framework for how to measure success uh, and also to to organize any sort of research that may happen around the the project site, so that there's a, a good way of communicating those uh, successes or or challenges that uh, that come up as part of the completion of the project. Uh, here's another long question. Will certain species of plants be installed in each planting phase, or will essentially all of the species being grown get planted out together in their respective plant communities? That's a great question. So <clears throat> we focused what we were talking about tonight on the stage one portion of the of the project footprint. And I think it's important to acknowledge that stage one is predominantly coastal sage scrub community because of the kind of exposed condition of that area on top of the structure. And as we transition into those areas on either side in the approach slopes, the plant communities expand and, and diversify uh, and, and marry up to the species, uh, to the plant communities that are part of the Santa Monica Mountains landscape. And so in, and so I'm kind of, I'm answering this question in two parts. One is to say that the diversity of the plant community will expand as we get into stage two and we get off of the structure into those areas adjacent. Obviously there's more footprint, there's more uh, diversity in the site characteristics. But the other piece of this that's kind of tied to that monitoring and evaluation piece of it is that one of the metrics we would like to study is how successional plant growth evolves on the project site, especially as we're rebounding from the impacts from the Woolsey fire because of how, how that just eviscerated, especially in the north side of the project site and understanding how this this reciprocity between the plant community and the soil ecology uh, lead into successional growth strategies within the project footprint. So I hope that hope that answers most of that question. But if not, please throw another one out there. Uh, there have been two questions about mo getting more information on the water transport and the drainage. Uh, has it been solved or is it still in flux? So it, it it has been solved, um, and and again I'm kind of I'm gonna have to kind of skirt this, and I think that you know what Snow what may, maybe not everyone knows, but we've talked about with Snowdy is that maybe we do another presentation later on after stage two is done, you know after the project is complete to explain a little bit more about the all you know all encompassing and and everything from both phases or stages of the project, but the water coming off of the structure itself is a combination of anything that falls on the the structure as a result of, of just rainwater, right? Making its way down through the soil, pro soil profile to the drainage layer and getting that water off of the structure to preserve the integrity of the structure itself. There's also irrigation on top of the structure because you have a varying soil depth. And so we need to have you know, moisture content monitors on both ends so that we have a continuous uh, soil uh, uh, moisture content and have that melding from side to side. But any of that water that's introduced on top of the structure is going down, it's collected in pipes that are part of that sub drainage system on top of the structural deck. And the conventional approach would be to take those pipes, turn them down on the backside of the abutment wall and connect them to the storm sewer. But in this case, we've worked through with uh, the engineers at Caltrans and um, I will carefully say that that was a, this has been a bit of a, a fun, fun challenge or maybe a, a fun thing to challenge them with uh, to not connect it to the storm sewer and to instead vent that back into the landscape so that we we can benefit from the water coming off of the structure and reintroduce that back in the natural landscape. Um, and that really what that does as part of stage two is it allows us to add kind of a source point for what will be a kind of a modified ephemeral creek that makes its way up as kind of a draw moment that reaches the the top of the structure on the north side. There's another question here. Um, how different was this process in terms of design and approach to plant soil ecology from other wildlife crossing projects? Was it difficult to advocate for this level of ecological sensitivity? Well, I'll, I'll answer the second half of that and be it be a uh, an entirely pander to the audience since Lauren is here on on the call and and serves as as Beth's 
uh, right hand as as part of this effort. Um, and and uh, and since I work directly for the National Wildlife Federation, I'll say that advocating for this level of ecological sensitivity really wasn't the challenge. I mean, there's the challenge was convincing everyone that we could do that within the confines and the constructs of things like the standards, you know, and challenging uh, the status quo. Um, but the support for being able to do that was there from day one. And I think it's important to understand that that's why the partnership between these different entities is so key to the success of this project, because it allows us the ability to stretch these goals and expand the horizons and kind of go beyond what would be a knee-jerk reaction uh, in, in response and reaction to some of these things. Um, but to answer the first part of your question about the difference in this process relative to the design of the soils and the relationship between plant and soil ecology, it's, I, I can't say that that approach has been, has been used on other wildlife crossings to this extent, because I can't speak for how uh, other folks who have done these types of projects have done them. But I will say that it's a process that we use in many of our projects, whether we're working in uh, a conventional kind of a and &E type project, architecture and engineering type project for construction in an urban environment, or working on residential projects, or we're working on these sorts of connectivity projects, because it, it only requires that we take one or two steps further than a conventional approach of just plugging some plants in the ground that we know are supposed to be native to that location to step a step beyond that and think about the medium that they're installed in and that relationship between the soil community and the plant community. When is the planned opening of the World Wildlife Crossing? So the, the target right now is the, the end of 2025, beginning of 2026. Um, that has a pretty substantial asterisk after it, uh, only because you know the stage two drawings have not been let to bid yet. And so once the, the contract is awarded, uh, the contractor has a pretty substantial role in making sure that they're able to maintain that schedule. Um, and so that's part of what is communicated as part of the the documentation project and how the bids will be put or, or how the information will be put out there to bid. But the, the timeline will obviously need to be updated once the contractor's on board and we've confirmed that timeline for stage two with them. What is the projected weight of the finished project on the bridge area? Finished project and weight of the finished project on the bridge area. Do you mean the loading of the soil on top of the structure? Dahlia? I think that's who that message was from? Yeah, that's from Dyla. Yes. Or Dyla, sorry. I mean, yes, just like the weight of the, when it's finished and everything's on that bridge. Um, do you have an gotcha. idea how much that would be? So uh, the way that it's, the way that we we worked through the, the weight calculations was this uh, ongoing uh, dialogue with the structural engineers to understand what the what in the what the the dead load capacity was of the structure, and I think it's also something that's not terribly clear in the stuff we presented. But the profile across the structure is not consistent. It varies from about a foot of soil depth to about four feet. So we have a bit of artificial topography that's a part of that as well. And so in the areas where we have four foot of soil, um, I think the cubic i think the cubic weight in the four foot area requirement was to keep that loading below it's below 475 or 500 pounds uh for that cubic foot of surface area um so i can't give you the the full number for the entire surface i just know that there are parameters that we had for what the maximum loading was at those high those those deepest depths of the soil based on a fully saturated soil profile. And we're kind of working within the parameters the structural engineers gave us for that. In terms of plants, what is currently in the stage two areas? Um, are they those hills covered with in, invasive? So are they barren or uh, do no, it's they a, it's... planted? Are, are the native plants already there? 
it's a it's a it's a great question um and uh, and again it's unfortunate because i mean i probably could do this presentation and it would take you know four hours to go through all the content and everybody would you know be asleep at that point or you know five drinks in and the questions would be even more interesting um but the uh specifically in the area to the north where there's a substantial amount of impact from the Woolsey fire and this onslaught from the mustard. The, the challenge in that area is that as we look to restore this and, and the benefit of having this reciprocity between plant community and soil ecology is that specifically with mustard, it does not have a mycorrhizal association. And so that investment in the energy of that plant to throw its root system down a whole, you know, three, four, five, six inches, and then put six feet of growth above finished grade means that it's out competing all the rest of those native species. And because it's blocking out all those native species, you don't have the opportunity for that mutualistic association that Catherine was talking about between the soil ecology, the, the mycorrhizal fungi, and the native plants that should be there. So that response and how we put those plants back in those areas. And, and yes, the palette for those stage area, stage two areas is much more comprehensive. That is where we get into planting more of the oaks and walnut, you know, and toyon and, uh, and uh, um, uh, arroyo willow as we get down towards the, the creek corridor where we start to diversify that plant community in response to the, the conditions we're creating on site. It's that attention to creating this reciprocity between plant and soil that allows us to help push back against that onslaught of the invasive species, give the native species the foothold that they need to succeed in that area. And then ultimately what we're hoping is part of this like longer term management approach for the project and learning from that deployment is that it also becomes a catalyst for the continued kind of advancement of the restoration work that MRCA has been doing in that area post Woolsey fire. So um, to clarify, it's on the structure itself, it'll be coastal sage scrub. And then other in the other communities will be planted off the structure. In yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's it, that's a large part uh, due to the fact that we've we've got a limited soil depth on top of the structure itself, so you're not going to be able to sustain a you know an oak woodland habitat on a, a thin soil profile like that. Um, plus, you wouldn't want those types of plants necessarily growing on top of the structure anyway. You know, with the potential for it to fall into the travel way uh, if there were ever a, a, a you know a branch that fell, things like that. Um, so as we get off of the structure into the adjacent sloped approaches, that's where you get into the chaparral plant community. That's where you get into the oak woodland habitat and you start to expand that and you kind of knit up against the other plant communities that are that are part of that uh, part of the Santa Monica Mountain plant community. And what is the irrigation plan for? For the irrigation. Sorry, go ahead. It, for on the structure. Is there is there going to be ongoing irrigation there? There is irrigation on top of the structure, and there will be in the in the stage two area as well. Uh, it's an important piece of being able to ensure establishment of the the plant community as we as we deploy that on the site. Uh, but the other piece of it is that because we've got a varying soil depth across that structure, and then when you get off of the structure to the north and to the south, you're back on top of a more substantial soil volume. The piece that we're keying in between stage one and stage two are those moisture sensors that go along with the irrigation system so that we don't end up with it. Because I think what would be ridiculous is if we had this, you know, lovely green postage stamp over top of the roadway in the the heat and in the thick of, of August where everything is nice and, and brown and dry. Um, and you've got some, you know, lush green landscape landscape you know, stuck up over top of the freeway. We don't really want to see that, right? We want this to be connected landscape from north to south across this footprint. And so being able to create an uh, irrigation approach that's tied into the moisture content and creating that continuity uh, is, is a key piece. Um, there's also a, a, a you know, secondary benefit in that if there are moments when something is struggling, 
Uh, it gives MRCA as the as the entity that will be maintaining that vegetated surface the opportunity to use that system should they need to in the future. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the the irrigation system is is another key piece uh, of the the infrastructure for the project. Um, here's another question. Um, in could the process of plant soil ecology be in part due to the fact that the California floristic province is one of the 36 biodiversity hotspots of the world? Not sure I understand that question, but Susan, can you elaborate on that a little bit? No, Susan King. Asked... Um, I'm just thinking that you're doing a lot of um, very special things for this project. Love and enough. because we are um, in a biologic, it, it, one of the 36 um, biologic um, hotspots in the world, I think what we're, what I'm seeing is that we're doing things that are much more, um, more broad and really trying to support this plant community that aren't maybe done in other parts of the world or other parts of the country because you don't have this special situation that we have here. Does that, that's what I'm trying to say. Sure, sure. Well, I, I mean, um, maybe I'll put it, maybe I'll put it back to you this way. I would say that, yes, you're correct in that uh, the approach does have a, a degree of kind of hand in glove with the, the location that we're working. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it is important yeah. to acknowledge the the importance of it being one of those 36 biodiversity hotspots mm -hmm. and support that effort. But what I, beyond that, I guess what I would what I would say is that the approach to doing it this way is not exclusively um, an envelope or, you know, it's not exclusively a lens that's looked through just for this project. Okay. It, it is part and parcel to how our practice operates and, and how we do the work that we do. Some projects, you're not able to, to be as um, extensive with that, or in some areas you, you may not need that level of intervention, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it is a part of how we've structured the ethos of what we do as a practice to make sure that, that we are looking at both plant and soil as part mm -hmm. of the, uh, the design approach to finish mm -hmm. landscapes. All right, thank you. Sure, great question. Will the animal uh, animals have access to the crossing before it formally so, opens? How would they know? <laughs> I guess um, it's a another another great question, and the reason I I was smirking as as you're reading is I, I had pulled it up here on the side, and I knew that was was coming. Um, oddly enough the this question is is kind of baked into the design strategy behind separating stage one and stage two because if you if you think about this if you're looking at this from the top down right you're you're in a plane looking over the site the crossing its site uh, it, the crossing itself across the 101 is this it's the bottleneck point it's that that central portion of the hourglass it's the point of maximum compression for the work that we're doing and what I mean by that is that we're collecting, you know, this, you know, multiple acres on both sides where we've got a diverse planting palette. We're using all these different plant communities. We're stitching back into the, the native ecology uh, and the plant communities on both sides. And then as we come across the crossing, you're concentrating all of that. Right. And so if you see that as a point where this becomes like that, that thoroughfare, that hub, that intersection, like if you, if this is that spot where, you know, you've got two converging, you know, arterial roots, that we would use, you know, with uh, with bicycles and and cars and pedestrians, that intersection is the spot that gets beat up, right? It's the place that's got the most traffic, the most impact to it. So it's important that that point of maximum compression is as well established as it can be before we allow that connection for wildlife to use it, so that we don't have the deer coming across and eating all those tender shoots from those plants that Catherine has painstakingly grown in the nursery because I'm pretty sure that if they did that and they decimated that entire crossing, she would be very unhappy with me. <laughs> well, they're gonna be there someday. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay. 
Um, are you going to be recruiting a weeding crew? <laughs> um, I, I cannot comment on that. Uh, ultimately, once this is handed off from the contractor building the project to MRCA and Caltrans, you know, splitting the maintenance between structure and, and landscape, uh, it'll be a, com a conversation with MRCA as to how they, they intend to uh, engage in that process. And as follow up, uh, another quest, couple of questions were, you know, what what maintenance is going to happen for the crossing? Who who's going to be responsible for the plants long term? Yep, yep. So great question. Uh, the maintenance of the project is this very generous split between Caltrans, uh, who will be maintaining the structures in perpetuity. Um, which is a significant amount of investment. If anybody uh, knows how much time, energy, and effort goes into maintaining infrastructure, it's not a trivial thing. Uh, so there's a, a, a great uh, amount of thanks to, to Caltrans for agreeing to do that for the structures. As for the vegetated surface, that will be maintained by MRCA. You know, Effectively, what we're doing is we are connecting areas that they manage to the north of the freeway to areas that they manage south of the freeway. And so this is kind of expanding their their footprint across this uh, project area, uh, but they'll be maintaining that vegetated surface. Okay, so we'll have to trust them, I guess. <laughs> and well, uh, the benefit yeah. the benefit the benefit to that is that MRCA has been a, a key a key member of that process throughout you know, and has been involved in all these conversations about how we're looking at the design, you know, the plants that Catherine's growing in the nursery, the nurseries on lands that uh, that are maintained by by MRCA as well. So they are a very deeply vested member of the, the project partnership team. Uh, and I, I think that they are just as, if not more so committed to the success of this project moving forward because they know how many eyes are on the project. Okay. Um, I was just skimming through seeing if I missed any any of the chat questions and I, I think I covered them if anybody if I missed one you know please speak up um does anybody have any in-person questions they they care to ask at this point well I think if, I think, huh? I think we missed I think we missed one here from Barbara about shrubs that you're using especially for protecting the bridge from light and sound from the freeway. Okay. Um, All right. Thank so, you. Gotcha. <laughs> sure. Sure. So um, that's another interesting question. Um, I uh, admittedly took out a pretty substantial chunk of this presentation that focuses on all the, the work that's been done around sound and light. Um, the, this is a, a hundred pages of presentation that we went through that probably would have made it at least 150. Um, but yes, there there is a very specific and targeted strategy focused on how we're attenuating artificial light, both from light fixtures that are a part of the highway infrastructure, as well as vehicle traffic, but also mitigating for sound. Because I think the piece that is uh, important to understand in that regard is that we're we're working in one of the most frequented parts of the U.S. interstate system with 300 to 400,000 vehicle trips per day at this location. And the sound that emanates off the freeway as a result of that is quite substantial and, and incredibly disruptive to the natural environment. Are there going to be wildlife cams on, on the structure? Yeah, they there are actually, uh, aside from the, the monitoring camera that is is actually up on the the south slope right now. So for anybody who doesn't know, if you go to the Save LA Cougars website, there's a, a camera feed, a live feed from the crossing site. So you can see activity and construction that's happening there. Um, but beyond that, there is a whole series of sensors and monitoring devices that are part of the strategy that we're working through with the wildlife biology team to make sure that we have the tools in place to advance that science and research and build off of the, the last 25 years of the, the work that Seth and Jeff and their colleagues have been doing uh, on wildlife movement in this area. Um, and then on top of that, there are cameras that are that are currently out there that are part of that work that they've been doing uh, for the last two decades. Uh, so there are, there's active monitoring happening right now for wildlife movement, as well as 
some additional sensors that we've been able to place with uh, some of our, our extended project team to monitor sound uh, impacts pre, uh, during construction and post construction. Um, so that we're also measuring the efficacy of the, the work that we're doing to mitigate for sound. Um, oh, looks like Kelsey just put the link to the camera in the chat if anybody's looking. Okay, that's good. Um, just just to clarify, so if let's say the project's up and running, everything's planted out, you guys are gone. Who is really in charge of taking care of, if if indeed anything needs care, of the plantings in stage one and stage two? I mean, who's really, you know, there's two agencies that you mentioned, Caltrans and MRCA, but then you get in the blame game. If, who <laughs> is really in charge, you know what I mean? Sure, I, I mean, sure. that's if it's not your business. You're you're designing this. You're going to get it planted out, and then we trust to I don't know who for the long term. Yeah, well, I think you know, and, and I'll I'll answer the question only to the extent to which I should, which is to say that I have an incredible amount of trust in MRCA's capacity to take this on and to be able to maintain the work that's that's been done uh, and to, to see it be a continued success moving forward. Um, but I will also say that there's a substantial amount of time and energy and investment that's been entered into by the National Wildlife Federation to support an endowment for that continued work as part of the, you know, the, the stewardship of this site. Um, so I think that the, the project partners have all kind of thought through this, work through operating agreements, work through mutual understandings of responsibilities and are actively and consistently putting in, in place the things that are necessary to make sure that the project is a long-term success. So that the National Wildlife Fund, because they're kind of the NGO here, they're, they could be a watchdog also, right? Oh, I'm going to be watching mm -hmm. this every day, Snowy. So even when I'm not actually there, you know, on my okay, like, you're going to be in every Chicago. two weeks. <laughs> uh, I, I would, mean, I, I don't know. I might have to make a visit every week, Snowy, just to make sure everything is in, in place. Okay. You know, I care about it. You're going to have your own wildlife <laughs> camp there. <laughs> and, and you did mention doing a, a phase two of of this presentation. I guess that would be way in the future once. Um, Things get planted out. You're at stage two or something like that. I, you know, yeah. I think we could probably do something once once stage two design work is complete. Once the documents have bid have been bid, you know, so that it's more of a public document and it's more accessible, then we could we could look to something like that. So maybe uh, looking to to something uh, in you know later on in the year. Uh, we're looking to we're hoping to get RTL or uh, uh, sorry RTL is the Caltrans term. We're looking to, to get that bid out um, by the the end of the second quarter is kind of what we're targeting. Um, so maybe we could look to do uh, another talk sometime this fall uh, as, oh, a, oh, as a refresh okay. and give you an insight at that point. All right, I'll, I'll think about that. I haven't really planned any fall pro programs yet. I'm still working on, on spring. Did I sure. did we miss anybody's questions? If so, if you, anybody want to ask a question in person, this, I mean, this has been really fascinating and eye-opening, and uh, it was amazing the amount of work that has gone into just the nursery part of it. I know the planning part was unbelievable, and um, it's just, I thought I just saw a question. Maybe not. Well, Snowy, I mean, I, I will I will offer too. I mean, if anybody has questions that they didn't think of this evening, or has other questions that uh, that they've gotten from their contemporaries, colleagues, friends, family, uh, if they want to send those through, um, I can I'll send you my contact info, Snowy, so you can share it with with folks. Uh, please Somebody feel is, free to yeah. reach out. And um, 
people are saying we need it. You need to make a documentary of this. Maybe that's already in the works. It's it's currently it's currently underway. There's a an incredible uh, team of two sisters, uh, Aaliyah and Eliza, uh, from Earth Tones Lab, that are are working on that uh, with uh, with the National Wildlife Federation. So they've got a I think there's a, a sizzle reel uh, that they've put together with their their kind of initial stuff from the last couple years of filming that uh, uh, is available. Oh, it looks like Kelsey actually put a link to that in the chat as well to their website where you can see that uh, some of the stuff that they pulled together. What, uh, here's another question and it is one that I meant to ask too is what design elements will specifically deter people from going on the crossing <laughs> um, other than MRCA staff who should be there, but we all, you know, we sure. all know that MRCA and other agencies like that are kind of short-staffed. And um, what I was wondering, you know, are we going to have a campground there? Um, is no, it going to cause more problems than <laughs> solving? No, I think, um, so, uh, you know, there, there's the, this is a sarcastic response that we often give to that, which is that we're just going to plant areas uh, full of poison oak and Catherine's fostering some stinging nettle as well to, to oh. deploy out there. And, Yay. you know, and I'm on top there. of that, you know, on one of our plant walkabouts that Catherine and I did quite some time ago, you know, she warned me of how pointy the, the yucca was. And of course I went up and put my thumb against that. And here's the <laughs> end of my thumb, you know, even though I knew not to do that, I don't know. So maybe we'll just kind of put those three everywhere and then I'll keep people off of it. Um, but no, it's, uh, there, there are a series of strategies that can be put in place like that to try to deter people from wanting to cross. But I like to think about it a little bit differently, which is that the accessibility of the information around the project, the ability to see the project, whether it's the cameras up on the hill whether it's the educational overlook that's planned that'll be done there on the south mm -hmm. side of the, the freeway, uh, up on the on the slope overlooking the crossing, or the work that that Kelsey and her colleagues are doing at the Cougar Conservancy to do you know the the docent program to get people out there to answer questions, keep them at a safe distance, and be able to inform the public. I think that that does an incredible amount to keep people off of an area that they're not supposed to be in, when you inform them of the why, you're always gonna have the random ind individual that you know wants to challenge themselves or they want to be disruptive or they want to be that person who gets up on the crossing or wants to tag something or whatever it may be. I mean, that's, that's just uh, the nature of the society in which we live and the human condition. Um, but I think what we can do is for the vast majority of people providing those educational resources and that accessibility, in a virtual sense, uh, it gives people an ability to answer the questions that are nagging them. And then the rest of the folks that are the outliers, then, you know, that's where the, the staffing from MRCA, that's where the cameras that are there and we, the ability to see that if people are up there abusing that privilege, you know, to be able to, to you know, address those very specific challenges. Uh, but I don't know, I just, I kind of like to look at the glass half full and, and hope that that's not going to be a persistent issue because we're doing some of these things right now to, to protect against that. It's still going to be better than not sure, having sure. the crossing. So even if there's problems, it's still going to create space that maybe some animals can go zipping across and not get squashed flat. Yeah, sure. I, you know, it's just there's always going to be problems with open space areas, you know, the all right, I'm just looking at the end here. Everybody's saying thanks. It was a great, very great um, turnout. You know, love, really wonderful questions from, from the audience too. And I thank everybody for showing up. I thank um, you guys for making your presentation and for all the hard work that you're currently doing. And we look, again, I'll, I'll bug you about the... Uh, the field trip, got to put it, Sounds good. put it on our list of things to do. So thank you so much. And yeah, my pleasure. We'll bid everybody a
Have a good evening. I'm going to end the program. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great questions. I really appreciate it. All right. Take Bye. care. It was great. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>